as we're getting a bit near the end, I didn't feel it correct to close off this series without looking at a couple more of the unlicensed, inspired by titles. I mean, I could have filled out the 98th episode with, say, Mad Balls by Ocean, because it had a TV episode, one-off, a pilot, if you will. Um, But I thought, nah, let's save that for after the TV show's era. I will come back to you, Mad Balls. I'll have you in my hands. I've already covered a couple of inspired games already, um, with Dr. Watt, Kickstart 2, and the Star Trek games. But I just wanted to cast my eye back over another few before we close this thing out. You know, before we wrap it all up into a ball and hoik it into the dog shit bin of history. So let's start with Dallas, which, unlike the Atari and Commodore 64 game The Dallas Quest, wasn't related to the show at all. In case you had forgotten, Dallas was a glitzy American soap opera that was an international phenomenon. It ran from 1978 to 1991 and was focused on the affluent and dysfunctional Ewing family. Personally to me it looks about as appealing as pouring mercury raw down your penis end but millions tuned in to witness things such as Who Shot JR and Patrick Duffy waking up after being dead because the whole of the ninth season was a dream. Good God, that writing. The Dallas game was released commercially in 1983 by CCS for just £6. The aim of the game is that you have to steal away the black gold market from the Ewings. And that's Ewings, by the way, with a U, by the way, uh, not a W like in the TV show. Um, So there's that. So will you become king of the Texan oil market? The oil fields of Dallas are broken up into a grid and you're offered up sites for drilling. It's actually pretty in-depth for a game that runs on a 16k spectrum as you can run surveys on the site before you purchase your acquisition. You can set up production and oil rigs, you can build pipelines and you can drill. As we're all finding out, oil prices are prone to fluctuation, which can affect your revenue. You must be cautious about natural disasters like typhoons and industrial sabotage from JR's clan, along with the dreaded tax man. Make $200 million and take over the Ewing estates and you'll be a big old capitalist winner selling dead dinosaurs in order to turn the planet into an uninhabitable hellhole, you goddamn son of a bitch. Crash and Sinclair user both reviewed this game, but neither deigned to give it a score. Sinclair user said that it's a game that is guaranteed to turn the youngest youngster in your family into a megalomaniac. What a selling point. Crash called it a good strategy game on the whole, though the random elements do seem to intrude too effectively. My view is it's alright, not my type of game at all really, but pretty good, and despite its primitive design, it's pretty deep for what it is. Next up, and we've got our first text adventure, our first of three, so get used to that text adventure fans, Um, and it's based on the Douglas Adams classic novel Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which was of course adapted into a quality radio serial and a brilliant television show in the 1980s. It follows the interstellar adventures of one Arthur Dent, a rather ordinary Englishman who finds himself homeless after an alien race called the Vogons destroy his planet to construct a hyperspace bypass. The series ran for six episodes in early January 1981 and won the Royal Television Society Award of the most original programme of 1981. It was very funny, very inventive and very clever. Worth a watch if you can see beyond some of the ancient special effects and terrible makeup. You can, you're old and nostalgic like me. Get on it. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy the game was published by Estuary Software Productions in 1983. They got special permission from the great man Douglas Adams himself to produce this text adventure. Estuary were very much a small one bedroom sort of company as you can probably tell by the highly attractive artwork and tape. Hmm. 
As far as I can tell, this was their only release, and they charged £8.95 for it. But the advert said there'd be more releases from this company. Where are they? I feel so disappointed. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy game is pretty much what you'd expect of a text adventure programmed in 1983 in BASIC by a one-man team who released nothing else. It's a simple, low graphic adventure with very little in the way of a usable lexicon, but hold your horses before we crap too deeply upon it from our Vogan spaceship up there. It's a labour of love, a hobby that the chap has made a few quid off. We can't object to that. It can't be compared to more high profile text adventures that I've covered so far, as that just simply isn't fair. This was the guy's first try. Let's cut him some slack. There's no reviews of this mail order effort to be found, sadly, so let's just point our beak at the next game. The Prisoner was a 1967 television show. Patrick McGowan starred as a British intelligence agent who has woken up to find he's been dumped in a curious village and now needs to escape. Everywhere is monitored and a sentient balloon acts like security and scoops up naughty buggers who try and get away. The Prisoner seemed to be a popular choice for bedroom coders making games inspired by their favourite show. In the end I picked two that had prettier graphics than the rest because I'm really shallow. And I then whittled those two down to the one that was released for cash via the Prisoner Appreciation Society 6 of 1. That was the only way to get this game. The Prisoner is a visually quite pleasing game in a home coder kind of way. It features locales from the show mainly rendered in yellow. It's very easy to get lost in the village and it's peaceable locales though. The main objective is pretty predictable. You've got to escape and resume your normal life doing very normal Patrick McGuinney things. There's certainly more to it, I think, than the Hitchhiker's game, and it's a text adventure game that certainly benefits from the unsettling nature of the protagonist's predicament. It is a serviceable text adventure, then, and one that should be looked at if you're a crusty old goose who watched a show that was probably shown to the slaves when the pyramids were being built. I'm trying to make out that the show's very old. Finally, we've got 40 towers, and that's 40 with a U again. You want to avoid litigation? We've learned that you can avoid the long arm of copyright law then by just swapping your W's out for a U. So what's all this 40 towers malarkey then? Well, it's only one of the most beloved sitcoms of all time, despite only running for 12 episodes. The late 70s show set in Torquay features an incredible performance from John Cleese as the frustrated hotel manager, Basil Fawlty. It's a show that's still as funny today as it was back then, just by a few questionable elements when it comes to modern attitudes. Fawlty Towers is a loving tribute to the show and was programmed and released by Harbour Software and was available for the princely sum of £5.95 from some classified ads. Ooh. The game finds you trying to keep Basil's sanity for a week during a tumultuous time for him or indeed any other owner of a hotel. You see, we've got the visit of the health inspector. Uh-oh. Now this game's got some stuff. You can get bonuses for hitting the waiter Manuel and insulting the wife, Sybil, out of earshot. This is a game that definitely understands the source material upon which it is based. I mean, the longer you take to complete a task, the more frustrated Basil gets, and that's how his sanity erodes, so you might not make it through the week. It's all very clever, really, and the sense of humour is just spot on. I definitely rate it as one of the better text adventures I've played, just for its creativity and its complete understanding of how the sitcom worked. And even though it's not licensed, I think it's an admirable comedy effort on par with the likes of Yes Prime Minister or Adrian Mole. Not bad, Harbersoft, not bad. Unlike what Basil was feeling, I didn't feel angry at all. 
So that brings our brief look at a clutch of unlicensed games to an end. So what are we doing for the penultimate episode? Well, we're going to look at some sequels from the early episodes that I missed. So that means things, you know, like Trapdoor and, oh, Count Duckula 2. Like, subscribe. Okay, thanks. Bye. God, I'm not looking forward to that.